I've always found the sheer vastness of space to be a very thought-provoking concept. Here we are on Earth, caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, and when compared to the infinite amount of space out there, you realize just how insignificant not just Earth is, but our own individual lives. Our brains can't even fully comprehend just how huge the universe is, and so eventually, you stop thinking about it, and you get back to doing what you have to do. But some people never stop thinking about it, and make it their mission to go up to outer space to see what's out there, and push us past our earthly limits. It's a noble pursuit that sometimes has unfortunate consequences. Here are five terrifying disasters that happen in space. Number five, Soyuz 11. The Cold War between the US and the USSR wasn't fought with guns and bombs, but with economics and science. In the wake of America's Apollo 11 lunar landing, which was the first to put human beings on the surface of the moon back in 1969, the Soviets scampered to make a name for themselves in the space race. So the Russians launched the Salyut 1, which was the world's first orbiting space station where cosmonauts could visit, live in, and conduct research. Essentially, it was the first home in outer space, and there had been a couple of missions launched that used it successfully. Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsyev completed their training and after making the necessary preparations, they launched into space on the Soyuz 11 spacecraft on June 6, 1971. The mission, with its call sign Yantar, meaning Amber, arrived at the space station a day later. And their stay there at the Salyut 1 was quite productive. They even managed to conduct a live television broadcast on the 11th day of their stay, but that was cut short when a fire broke out on board. The crew managed to handle the situation, but ultimately things on board were not safe, and so they had to abandon it on June 29th, 23 days after their arrival. The three of them headed out just fine, bringing with them loads of specimens, film, and recordings of their mission. And they then arrived back on Earth in what was supposed to be a normal re-entry. However, they lost radio contact with the men. They landed, but no one exited the craft. And then when the recovery crew knocked on the hatch, everything was dead silent. The retrieving officials then had to forcibly open the door. And there, strapped in their seats, were the motionless three men. Their faces had a dark purple and blue hue and trails of blood flowed from their noses and ears. One still had a slight pulse, but he eventually passed away too. An autopsy indicated that the trio ultimately died of asphyxiation. Upon the investigation, they discovered that a breathing ventilation valve located between the orbital and descent module had been jolted open. Apparently, while they were still miles away from the Earth's atmosphere, there was a misfire on the mechanism that caused the valve to loosen its seal. This resulted to the loss of pressure that proved fatal to these passengers. Exposure to the vacuum environment caused the oxygen and nitrogen in their bloodstreams to bubble and rupture vessels. This in turn led to hemorrhaging in the brains. The fallen cosmonauts were eventually given a large state funeral and buried in the Kremlin Wall necropolis of the Red Square in Moscow, laid to rest next to the famous Yuri Gagarin. NASA's lead astronaut, Tom Stafford, even attended the rites to serve as one of the pallbearers. The disaster led to further improvements and a redesign of the Soyuz spacecraft, which then ensured the safety of those who followed after these three brave Russian space explorers. Number 4. John Smith Space is full of unknowns. And there are several mysterious incidences that have occurred in this empty void that not everyone knows about. And the reason we don't know about all of them is because the powers to be, aka the government, doesn't want all their secrets shared. For example, take this fascinating story about the unknown NASA astronaut named John Smith. 
Born in 1941, Smith reportedly received his Medal of Service as a pilot during the Vietnam War in the 1970s. After a stint there in the Air Force, he then applied for a job with NASA. With his extensive flight experience and NASA expanding their work, he was then hired to be a space scavenger. Basically, that means his work was to be a cleaner and to clear out the near-Earth area of space from fragments brought about by carrier rockets and parts coming off from disintegrating out-of-surface satellites. But Smith, while he was going to be up there, surely there was more he could do than just be a space janitor. During the presidency of Ronald Reagan, America had initiated a secret program where its goal was to detect enemy activities happening outside of Earth. And prior to this, space was a new frontier and it needed to be watched closely and so the Pentagon sent John into space aboard a ship disguised as a satellite in October of 1973. On paper, their mission was to conduct a study of orbital space and for three days everything went according to plan. However, on the fourth day, the ship's orientation system reportedly went haywire. This failure then plunged the spacecraft into what experts call the radiation belts. As the term would suggest, this area is extremely hazardous. Not only will the human body be adversely affected, but also electronic instruments on board. The agency tried to make various attempts to rescue the trapped astronaut, but all those efforts failed. It didn't help either that all communication between Smith's ship and the headquarters got disconnected. The incident left everyone reeling, but since this was clandestine work, the accident could never be publicized. Eventually, the government had to cover up the situation and decided to pretend as though it never happened at all. Meanwhile, NASA officially booked the launching as unsuccessful and the astronaut dead. Fast forward to 2000, 27 years since Smith disappeared when an amateur astronomer from Fiji contacted NASA after he discovered a strange object orbiting Earth at an altitude of about 300 miles. Now, here's where things get strange and really turn into conspiracy mode, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. NASA confirmed this to be the missing spy satellite, and it was then brought down back to the ground in 2001. When the capsule was then finally open, they were shocked to find Smith in some sort of cryogenic state. He was unconscious and his body temperature very low. Doctors were called in to revive the now missing astronaut and apparently they were successful. But not long after, they noticed something was off with Smith. His medical records, for instance, showed that he had a rib fracture, but now, just a few days later, that was completely healed. Also, his heart had moved further to the right side of his chest cavity, which is of course not normal in humans. Looking at his notepad from the mission, they found it filled with scribbles and strange characters that didn't seem to be from Earth. And by this time, experts became wary that possibly this person wasn't human at all, but a creature who can shapeshift. As if that wasn't intriguing enough, after a few days in the hospital, John suddenly disappeared. Where he went, or is now, no one can really say, or at the very least, is willing to. Number 3. Apollo 13 Houston, we have a problem, is the phrase you know from the Apollo 13 mission. If you're wondering why exactly it was said, then this next story will unfold the real drama behind that quote. On April 11, 1970, the Apollo 13 was launched from the Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island in Florida, what was supposed to be the third human landing on the moon. The crew was comprised of Commander Jim Lovell, along with Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes. Both were scheduled to land on the Lunar Module Aquarius and explore the moon's Fra Mauro region. The third man, Command Module Pilot Jack Swigert, would remain in lunar orbit in the Command Module Odyssey. Everything went smoothly, but on the third day, when the spacecraft was about 200,000 miles from Earth, something went wrong. 
The routine activation of a fan in one of the service module's oxygen tanks caused a short circuit in the system, which, in turn, triggered an explosion, and the two oxygen tanks then ruptured. After finding this out, Hayes and Lovell radioed the information to Mission Control, saying, Houston, we have a problem. The planned moon landing was scrapped, and the crew scrambled to come up with another plan. The only option was to use the lunar module as the vessel that would bring them back to Earth, but the problem now is that that module was designed to support just two astronauts and not three. With the addition of one more, Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes had to drastically adjust their rationing on food, water, and even oxygen. As if this situation wasn't critical enough, the trio also had to deal with the rising CO2 levels. To remedy this, they designed a system using plastic bags, cardboard, and duct tape that would allow the ship to process the exhaust gas. Meanwhile, the whole world witnessed, and then people braced themselves as the astronauts went through the entire ordeal. With a little bit of ingenuity, they repurposed the engines on the Aquarius to make trajectory correction maneuvers. This eventually helped them make their way back to Earth. The results of the post-mission investigation revealed that the tank explosions were caused by overvoltage. And to prevent such accidents in the future, NASA engineers redesigned the Apollo spacecraft to include a third oxygen tank, which would be isolated from the other two. Though they weren't able to land on the moon, Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes made it back home to Earth safely, and it resulted in one of the most well-known stories of survival to ever take place in space. Number 2. Space Shuttle Challenger In 1984, the U.S. government conducted a nationwide search for the best and brightest civilians interested in a mission to outer space. Yes, long before Elon was talking about colonizing Mars with regular folks, NASA wanted to show that not everyone needed to be an engineer or fighter pilot to see what life was like above the Earth. The screening process was in-depth, and ultimately, they chose a teacher, Krista McCullough, from Concord, New Hampshire, to join the ride. Aside from installing new parts for a satellite, the agency's plan was to send the educator to space where she would conduct lessons from Earth's orbit. The real objective being to spark the interest of students in seeking out technological careers. Along with McAuliffe were Flight Commander Francis Scobie, Pilot Michael Smith, Mission Specialist Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, and Aircraft Engineer Gregory Jarvis. Now, the Challenger had been in space before, flying on 10 missions and spending a total of 62 days in space. But like a bad omen, the mission initially suffered several technical setbacks, forcing NASA to postpone the launch for several days. But finally, on January 28, 1986, America finally gave the green light for the Challenger to set off into space. It shot up into the sky, leaving a huge trail of smoke from the rocket boosters, while millions of people around the world, especially school children, watched in awe during the televised launching from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But then, just about a minute after takeoff, a malfunction in the vessel's O-rings, which are rubber seals that separate the spaceship from its rocket boosters, blazed up in a fire. This caused the destabilization of the boosters, swaying the entire shuttle from its intended trajectory. The fire then quickly spread through the entire rocket system. With the shuttle moving faster than the speed of sound, the movement caused it to almost instantaneously break apart mid-air. Initial reports indicated that the crew had actually survived the explosion itself, but ultimately, everyone perished in this tragedy mainly as a result of the impact with the ocean below. But from the time of the explosion to the time it hit the water, it took 2 minutes and 45 seconds, meaning the terror that the people inside must have felt lasted a cruelly long time. It was a heart-wrenching sight, one that many people who watched that day have burned into their memories. The Challenger shuttle disaster paved way for the ultimate suspension of the space shuttle program altogether. 
And in 1988, the government paid a total of $7.7 million in cash and annuities to the families of the seven Challenger astronauts. Meanwhile, the Rogers Commission was created to dig deeper into the cause and fault of the explosion, with its goal being to avoid what was considered to be the nation's worst space disaster from ever happening again. Number one, the Nederland disaster. Aside from being used in warfare, rockets are what makes space exploration possible for humans, which is why space agencies and governments need to spend huge amounts of money and resources in developing them. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union was in the middle of building what they called the most powerful rocket yet, the R-16. The project was so important that Russian leadership put a marshal of artillery, Mitrofin Nedelin, in charge of running the development. Designed by famed rocket scientist Mikhail Yangel, the R-16 was supposed to be presented to then-Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, who demanded it be unveiled in October of 1960. Because of this rush, it was here that the problem supposedly started. Yangel admitted that the technology was still in its early developmental stages. However, with the urging from the higher-ups, Nedlin was forced to cut some corners in order to meet that deadline. Technicians raised concerns of technical glitches on the flight control system, but Nedlin again, pressured by his bosses, suppressed the report and pushed on with the rocket's installation at the Soviet launch site in Kazakhstan. But more issues followed, like the unintended ignition of pyrotechnic valves on the first stage engines. And this led to the leakage in the fuel lines, which, according to accounts, spat out an estimated 142 to 145 drops per minute. Requests were made to repair the valves and the tank, as well as to drain its contents before filling it up again, but Nedelin sternly refused. He even retorted by saying that there'd be no time for such things in a nuclear war. And so, to control the spillage, launch managers opted to assign technicians to simply solder the leaking, fully-fueled rocket. As you could imagine, this is exactly one of the many ingredients in the recipe for a gargantuan disaster. On October 24th, a group of high government officials arrived in Kazakhstan to view the launch with a viewing stand having been set up for them just a few hundred yards away from the pad. Everyone was ready to revel at Soviet's might, but a slight delay had once again occurred. This prompted Nedelin to step down from his platform and over to the launch pad to oversee and hasten the crew for launch. He was literally only a few yards away from the base of the rocket, and when warned not to get too close, his only reply was, what's there to be afraid of? And so, it happened. Before the countdown even got to zero, the propellant line valves of the second stage accidentally opened, resulting in an unintended ignition of the engine. Everything lit up as the rocket exploded, sending toxic gases and flaming propellant everywhere, creating a fire with temperatures reaching more than 3,000 degrees. A camera, which had been set up to supposedly record the launch, instead captured the horrifying event. Nedelin and those closest to the pad died instantly. The rest of the workers ran around in panic as they tried to put out the flames engulfing their bodies. Those furthest away tried to escape, but they too perished from the toxic, acidic fumes that enveloped the area. News spread fast, and the incident, which reportedly claimed almost 100 lives, was now referred to as the Nedelin disaster. This completely avoidable disaster has since served as a cautionary tale for everyone never to rush the design or development of complex systems, especially if we're dealing with highly explosive elements like that of rockets. That's going to do it for our episode today. If you enjoyed it, please check out more of our content and remember to subscribe and hit those notifications. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll see you over in the next one.